Last year, America took in its best revenue year ever, a little over $5, $5 trillion. And of course, some of that should grow in that expand as we get to 50 trillion. But the interest express is far outstripping it. We would be seeing over half our uh, income just to pay interest. What about something that you just brought up that no one wants to talk about? People are still expecting to get Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And there's no money sitting somewhere. As I try to explain to seniors and all when I speak to them, this isn't sitting somewhere. We've spent that money already that was taken from you and so forth and so on. So they have to come up with that. Oh, and by the way, I always had this kicker. Do you know America's largest single asset? What, are, what do we have the biggest on our books as an asset? And I tell them student loans. And now we have a president that's forgiving those billions of dollars at a time. Well, if he forgives that, that was an asset the U.S. was counting on. So that means they have to raise taxes even more. And who are they going to raise it from? You, and I point to the people and me. Hey guys, Capital Cosm here. Before we start this video, I just want to let you know that I believe that we are on the cusp of a major uranium bull market. Now, these things don't happen every other week. The last uranium bull market peaked in 2007, the one before that, in 1978. So when these things happen, you've got to take advantage of it. And how explosive are they? Well, you've all heard the stories, uranium skyrocketing from $10 to $20, all the way up to $150 in these uranium bull markets. Where will it go this time around? Well, we don't know, we'll see. But you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. What better way to do that than to leverage Justin Hune's Uranium Insider newsletter. You get access to his monthly newsletters, his webinars, his stock picks, his portfolio, all of that stuff. You get access to guests that you may not see on YouTube. You get access to having them ask questions that you may not see anywhere else. So I highly recommend if you're going to take part in this uranium bull market, you check out Uranium Insider. Link is down in the description box below. Be sure to click the link. There's quarterly plans, there's annual plans. So if you're kind of tepid, you're kind of hesitant, you could always go with the quarterly plan, kind of test things out, sample things out, see if you like it or not. But the way I see it, guys, you know, you've got to pick the right stock. A lot of these uranium companies are not going to make it to the other side. Now, and, and Justin Hune's uranium portfolio has outperformed the likes of URA by a significant margin. Since 2019, it's up 5x from where it started. So click the link down below and we'll get started right now on the video. Thanks, guys. Hello and welcome to Capital Cosm, everybody. Today, I have a very special guest on the show. I am super excited to interview. It is none other than Mr. Peter Grandich. Peter, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, I'm equally looking forward to speaking to you as well. Thank you for having me. 100%. As always with these videos, guys, nothing on this video is financial advice. I am not a financial advisor, so please do your own due diligence. With that said, Peter, you are a legend, if you, even if you say it's within the confines of your own mind. But nonetheless, it's also in the confines of other people's minds. But for those who may not know who you are, give us a background on uh, on yourself. Well, that would take uh, much longer than you have time for. But uh, approaching my 40th year in around the financial arena, started way back in the early 80s as a stockbroker, managed to hedge some hedge funds and mutual funds, came a legend in my own mind back then for certain, and uh, went into the corporate uh, consultant side. And then in 2000, I went back into the money management side, dealing with professional athletes. And uh, that stayed pretty much the same until uh, all the social and political stuff hit to a point where I couldn't digest it and, and live my life every day at the same time. But I've always been in, in and around the metals and mining industry. And here in the very late stage of my career, uh, I still am focused on them. Uh, and also, I still have a planning business for the general public, but just for residents of the United States. Fantastic. So you have a storied career. I, I want to kind of pick at that, though. You know, Across the, your years of investing experience, is there any life experience that you'd like to use as a form of a piece of advice for some of the younger members of the audience watching? Sure. So having lost enough money to last many lifetimes, uh, those of us who live or claim we live by looking into a crystal ball to know the future, we really only become experts on how to eat a lot of broken glass over time. So uh, 
first thing you need to be able to say in this business, which Fonzie had a tough time saying, I was wrong. Uh, and uh, you're going to say that quite often. I think the second other thing is, and I think the thing that just kept my head above water is I tend to be early. I, I tend to be early and sometimes it's, they call that contrarianism, but it's much better to be a year too early than a day too late. And we're, we're, where a lot of investors end up losing is once it's, once it's so evident that seemingly everybody's speaking about it, the bulk of whatever that is has been made. Doesn't mean they can't take it a little further, but to make real fit, large sums of money, you have to be in uh, uh, before most. And so uh, I tend to look at things that are completely out of favor uh, and uh, have focused on that. Doesn't mean that that's guaranteed to work, but there's much more opportunity. And even though you'll have some serious losses in that, the ones that do work more than usually more than make up for the ones that lost. Yeah. Yeah. So you're counting on asymmetry essentially to, to kind of pay off your losses as well. So is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And, and whenever you're trying to turn a dollar into three or four, there's an awful lot of risk known and unknown. I I'm at this 40 years and I still shake my heads and go, why didn't I see that? You know, even though I'm supposed to be the guy that has all this experience and also this, there's always a lot more uh, to be learned. And unfortunately, you don't want to get into something where you lose so much that you don't have the affordability to take that learning experience and do better the next time around. Understood. Can you give us an example of a time when you came in early and uh, it, it, it actually paid off and an example where you came in early and nothing actually panned out? Well, it's coincidentally, they're almost at the same time. I would say, I guess it's because it's presence on my mind versus trying to think what I was doing 30 something years ago. But perhaps the earliest thing I ever came into, ironically, was the first time I ever took any substantial position in it. In the 2019-20 period, I had never really been involved with uranium, even though I was around the junior resource market a lot. Uh, but Suddenly, I heard somebody speak about it and where it was. I couldn't believe it was under $20. And we were just starting to talk then about the transition into this electrification. And I just concluded in my head, well, they're going to need nuclear energy. And so I got very involved. And in that first year, uh, things didn't go up a lot. And of course, people become very short. If you ask me to do between now and 40 years ago, the public has a much shorter time horizon now. They expect results much faster than what is normal or what we were used to 30 or 40 years ago. So I would say the uranium play was that one uh, where being early paid. Where I've been the opposite of that is, if you and I were having this interview this time last year, I would have told you back up the truck, the junior resource stocks are as cheap as possible, load up. And 30% lower after that, or some maybe even 50, here we are. So uh, it works both ways. But I am convinced that it, it is not something that somehow has a, has an expiration date or, or or the boat is sailed and there's no other chance. It's just that in that case, I was far too early. With the junior miners? Well, only because of this. And, and, and I don't know what your work specific is and all, but I just simplistically, if the world is correct right now, the, the I call them the don't worry, worry, be happy crowd that makes up much of Wall Street, but they are talking about this great electrification, this great expansion and needs of metals for a variety of reasons for the future of life. Well, that's the case you need to find those metals. And there has been really a shortage of real capital for over a decade that has not gone into that industry to look for those metals that's going to make this story doable. And also where you go is become critical. I like to tell people 20 or 30 years ago, we could have been at a show and spun a globe and point our fingers and say, yeah, we can go mining there. That's not the case anymore. The, for me, it shrunk dramatically. I've limited my exposure to North America, but it's far more critical now on where you're looking and what can happen in those places. So I, I really think that if 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 the main street is right about where the world is going, knowing the situation of the underlying supply versus demand of metals, we're going to need a need to find lots more. And usually, those things are found by junior kind of companies, and therefore there should still be a market for these things. 
And I said that to you, but you're not seeing that, but my toes and fingers are crossed as I said that. Right. So you made a great point, uh, bringing up the underinvestment of CapEx over the course of several years now. I mean, this stuff isn't cheap to get out of the ground. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes the capital. Um, all the while, <clears throat> as the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, much to the sh chagrin of many people on Wall Street, has been actually raising rates, which makes it even harder to actually finance these high, highly expensive projects to begin with. So, you know, essentially, the uh, the the future supply gets dwindled and dwindled down even further. Would you kind of agree with that? That Fed, that Fed rate hikes have actually added to the problem of potential more inflation down the line, given the fact that underinvestment in these um, uh, projects uh, has, has only gotten worse? Uh, absolutely. One of the biggest costs for mining exploration now is the actual cost to do it. And uh, that's all been impacted by what's been done with interest rates. But just as important as that is, is if you're a major mining company, and you're watching countries literally, we're seeing it now, unfortunately, for this company, First Quantum, we're seeing social and political unrest in areas where people have gone and mined and they, they're demanding uh, either the miners give up a good portion of the mine or take a hike. Uh, do you want to start thinking about sinking a couple of billion dollars into a new mine in a, in, in a country where you have little or, or no control if somebody decides to change the rules or change the, the board plan? And that's the same in oil and gas as well now, because the oil companies were so beaten up by this current Biden administration, in many ways made into the, the bad person for all the reasons things went up. Why should they risk go out and spend all this money, especially when you're telling everybody five or 10 years from now, you don't even want gas cars? So uh, there's 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 been a separation of it's great to have this future that this uh, world has of where we're going to be as economies and all, but the to get there we need a bunch of metals and it's there there isn't that readiness availability of it and now there's another kind of thing that's come into vogue in the last few weeks and that is the condition of China something that for a lot of years we have not been concerned about, but there's a lot of things happening in China. And when their stock market begins tanking like it has and so forth and so on, you have to start to wonder what's really happening there. And they're always a key part of the commodity market as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons and there's not an ample amount of supply in a lot of different metals. And that's why I remain optimistic despite looking at a portfolio sometimes at night and going, are you really Peter Brandage? Yeah. So what do you, do you think that the torque that one can get from these mining equities uh, is enough to undo some of the risk-free juris jurisdictional free, risk-free aspects of just owning the metal straight up? If I own a, 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 a bar of silver or a, or a gold coin, I don't have to worry about whether or not, you know, it, it's in my possession. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Whereas with a lot of these gold and silver mining uh, stocks, you, you, you know, it, there's a lot of risk that comes with it. So, do you think that the potential upside, the added upside with these mining stocks, is enough to uh, to outdo uh, some of the less risk that's you know in, embedded within just owning the physical metal itself? So we have seen in the last 12 to 24 months, certainly in the 40 years that I've been around the financial arenas, the worst uh, junior resource market. And for that matter, a lot of the major mining companies as well. It's the worst ever. And I was first time I was ever on the wrong side of a vicious bear market. One of the things that used to be said, and as you and I speak, there's a major one of the best conferences in the world going on that involves mining and juniors. We all used to say as experts at those shows Folks, owning mining shares is like owning the metals themselves. Well, this last 12 to 24 months proved that's not the case. And that should never be said again, just like transitory should never be said by the Fed. I certainly will never say that again, what's ever left in my natural life. So you make a very good point. There is a major difference. And it's one of the reasons, and ironically, when I did get very bullish on uranium, uh, that I looked at wanting to own only the companies that own it physically or actually produce it at that at that point, not the ones that are going to explore for it. And uh, there were reasons for that too, but the, you're right. Metal, metals, if you're going to believe in the metal story, owning the metals wherever possible 
is as important as only the shares. The gambling, and let's call it as it is, Wall Street came up with a word many years ago, so they don't have to say gambling. It's called speculating. But speculating and gambling is the same damn thing. You have to be prepared mentally and financially to lose part of all your investment. And that's the other thing you have to be cautious about when you're looking at the shares versus, as you say, owning the physical metals where chances are of large losses uh, especially when they're out of favor. It's, it's just not there. Where you could pick that junior stock that doesn't succeed in finding something, the metal prices go up, but because you picked the one junior that didn't find what it did, you didn't participate in it. Right. So you mentioned speculation there. Uh, when constructing a portfolio, what are some of the things or best practices that you kind of look towards in terms of portfolio allocation? Like whether it be in terms of speculation, um, precious metals investments, um, inv actual investments, and so forth. Do you have like a a set uh, list of rules that you go by? Essentially, you know, maybe no more than five percent or twenty percent on a position, a single position, something of that nature. Yeah, those things are important. I've always and I've tried to make it known is I'm a speculator slash gambler at heart. Uh, owning utility stocks, even when I was a fund manager and a portfolio management not only did not give me the excitement, it wasn't an area that I focused on. I was always in the area trying to turn a dollar into two, three, and four. And I specialized at times turning four, three, two into one. So I, you know, I, I learned pretty hard the hard way. The most difficult thing, particularly to the juniors, and I paid the price again, I took a very extremely large position in a company where management hasn't lived up to what I think expectation should be. So if I can make one blanket rule on the, the metals and mining industry, particularly in the juniors, management is the absolute key. Uh, it's the most dominating, important factor to those companies. Let's understand that most companies explore basically the same way. It's not like uh, uh, computers where every six months technology is changing or retail, the how you sell your wares in a store, you have to keep changing every six months. Mining is kind of vanilla, so to speak. So what a management does on that end, raising capital, getting the most for shareholder value by maximizing your exposure. So uh, you get people to pay the best possible price for your stock. Those things are extremely seemingly critical. And they normally fall back on, well, if they've done it in the past, that's a first sign versus taking somebody who hasn't done it yet. And uh, I, I think that's perhaps one of the, the, the biggest point and still a learning process for me and a stumbling process at sometimes uh, at this point. Now, I have to make one asterisk in this as I'm down way down this road of my career. I've also concluded that if and when I could ever find somebody that clearly demonstrated unbelievably skills that come necessary, uh, integrity, in high intelligence, humbleness, and for me also important, a man of faith, uh, I finally found that person. So now I focus kind of on whatever he's doing, I'm going to look at. Uh, and that goes back to a thing I learned a long time ago, because I entered this business by accident. I never had an education to be involved in this industry. And that is, I'm never going to be the smartest, second smartest, or third smartest. But if you can find one of those three, and you can ride their coattail, you'll probably do better off than being on your own. Yeah, yeah. It's important to have a, a network of mentors, uh, colleagues, etc. Because even if you are the smartest person in the in the room, you're not going to be smarter than the room itself, collectively. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, I want to ask you, though, when you're identifying opportunities, uh, what are some of the key factors that you look at? Do you uh, use any technical analysis? It seems more you're, you're more so on the fundamental side. But yeah. uh, what do you think there? Uh, technical analysis is, and I, I'm going to get some people upset, but it's virtually useless in junior little 20 and 40 and 50 cent stocks. That's not what, everything that's happening fundamentally is what's causing that stock to make highs, lows, cross this moving average, whatever the case may be. I, I, I don't find it as valuable as in more higher price regular stocks and also markets in general as well. Because for two reasons, A, technical analysis is still used by a variety of people and the computer driven programs, you know, which people have to understand much of the stock market now is driven by some sort of program, whether it's a simple program of 
that's simply trading on headline news and words in, in headlines to sophisticated programs of you know options and futures and simultaneously buying and selling it. Part of that is technical analysis, especially if you're involved in commodities and futures, where that's heavily driven by technical analysis. You're much better off if you're going to trade, and I'm not telling you, but if you're going to trade pork bellies, you're better off trading on the technical chart of pork bellies than the fundamental argument for pork bellies. Uh, pork bellies being uh, the majors? No, pork bellies itself, the commodities. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so you, you're too young. Pork bellies was a great line in one of the best trading commodity movies ever. It was called Trading Places. It's a movie from a long time ago, but that was the key word in it. But but what I'm just saying is commodities in general, whether you're even silver and gold, if you're trading it, technical analysis is going to be more useful to you than the fundamental story of the day. Understood. Understood. So we've covered the buy side. Let's cover the sell side. What are some uh, sell side indicators that you look for in, for an exit plan? So one of the lines I heard from all the different hats I wore from financial advisor to corporate communication and everything in between is, hey, you guys always tell us when to buy. You never tell us when to sell. That was a standard line from the public. And I had a simple response. And to this day, it's still my number one response. You have to make like today's the first day, would you take the capital you have, forget what you paid for and all, but the amount of dollars you have and first buy that stock or whatever you're looking at today based on what you now know. And if you hesitate or even say no, that's a red flag to whether or not you should stay in it or not. If you can say yes, then there's nothing to consider about selling. I'll just say this. More times than not, an old, old line ends up prudent. And that is a half a loaf is better than none. And so what I've tried to do, even in the speculative gamblings, is I try to have what's called a scaled up point of view. I'm at that point in uranium now uh, to where I've said, based on a price moving, maybe you should start moving out of some of these things if and when it goes higher and higher. So, but I think the first critical thing is if you can't buy something today and you're going to hope other people are going to come along and not only pay higher and higher, let me just say this. Hope is one of the best spiritual strategies. It's the single worst investment strategy. If you're hanging on by, I only hope this goes back uh, to what I paid for it or what I hear now, particularly by junior resource stocks, I hope this goes back. And if it ever does, I'm never going to look at these things or own them again. The, those are, A, the classic things that are set closer to a bottom, but that isn't how you want to handle uh, your personal investment strategy. There must be defined plans and, and plan A, B, and C. One of the things I got, if you don't mind me sharing this, this is kind of critical for me. In the years that I worked with professional athletes, I also was able to work 13 years with the New York Giants. And I'm not saying this to brag and all, I'm just using it. So I got to sit in and I seen them how they would go in and plan starting on Wednesdays and even sit in the game plan when the coach would talk to the team just before we would have chapel. And one of the things I realized is none of these coaches go into these games without a game plan. And they have a plan B, even before plan A, whether they see it's going to work or not. And I think we need to approach investing that way. We need to have a set plan, but we also have to have a what if plan. And what if all the best things don't work? Because here's what used to happen at shows. People only came to shows for two reasons. I don't think it's changed. And now, of course, it's the same way in people looking in on, on computer driven programs. They would come to a gold show and only hope to hear somebody confirm what they already believe. They don't want to hear the different opinion. They just want to hear enough people say what they want to believe. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. The other thing is, is that you need to do is to understand that there is always another side to every story, including your story that you've fallen in love with in your company. And you have to be open-minded to that. And so I think if we can get past those two things and understand that, uh, I think that would be very advantageous for people.
Yeah. So essentially, you know, if your strategy is to pray and hope for the stock to rebound to where it was when, when you got in or, or get back into black, most likely often than not, a miracle will not happen. So that's a bad, that's a, that's another suboptimal strategy there. And as well, you know, a lot of people tend to get married to their stocks. I, I mentioned this over and over again on the, on the show here, but the thing with marriage is at least with these stocks is that uh, divorce is inevitable. You know, we're, we're, we're buying these stocks, but we also, there's going to come a time where we sell, there's going to come a time where we sell gold and silver, going to come a time where we sell uranium. There's going to come a time when we sell uh, uh, all uh, our portfolio in general. So when people get married to, or start identifying themselves as uh, an X, Y, Z bull, and that becomes part of their identity, it becomes harder and harder to actually, you know, get, take profits in a sense. Yeah, well, that, that's where the word, you know, perma bears or perma bulls, people that are always one sided thinking and so forth. I can tell you that still to this day, some of the speakers I see that are at this show that were speaking when I spoke 20, 30 years ago, they've never really had a different opinion. It's always been that that, that similar opinion. And, and of course, like a broken clock, that opinion will fit in sometime during the course of cycles and how things go. But like you said, if you just hold on to something and no matter what, uh, no ifs, buts, or ends, that, that, that can, that can cause you some, from some serious issues. And of course, uh, eventually what happens is you'll become so disenchanted that you, you will move out, but you'll make the decision, well, I'm never going to participate again. And that in itself can be costly because in some senses we have to be investing because without investing and just punching a clock and, you know, going to work, it, it, you, you're never going to be able to reach some of the personal goals you might have of, you know, bettering yourself or things that you wish to, you know, to have as, as you, you know, past necessities, things that would be considered luxuries. 100%. Uh, what do you see now uh, in terms of opportunities? Well, I made a decision, quite frankly, in the end of, by end of 2021, and I shared it at the time was that I didn't want to own any non-commodities related or natural resources related uh, investments, particularly anything that would be equity in the United States. In fact, I was extremely bullish on gold and still am. And, and despite the rally in the stock market, gold is actually, as we speak now, at the same percentage of where the stock market was two years ago. But what has increased since that comment is, which I started the New Year's off to my podcast, to the clients we still have and to friends and followers that want to listen is, I really believe a near perfect storm now has come together uh, that within three to five years maximum, we're going to see a, a situation here in the U.S. where socially, politically, and economically, things are going to be such an upheaval that it's going to give a good run to what the Great Depression did to people. Uh, that's how bearish I would I would guess how it was. And if you like, I'll just name the five ones. And if you want to ask me more about them, but I'll tell you the, the five reasons. The first still is still number one, debt. Uh, it is completely out of control. We're now seeing multi-trillion dollar budget deficits. Not, I mean, we're, we're seeing in two years what it took 200 years <laughs> to get to. And it's, out, it's completely out of, there's no formula for it to stop. They can't even, all they now pass Congress is budget resolutions. They don't even pass a budget. They yeah, just yeah. pass a resolution to fund the government for another three months, hike up six, seven hundred billion dollars more than previously, and they keep doing this. So there's no, there's nothing in place or to stymie this rise. And why that's important, the Congressional Budget Office, which is really the last bastion of bipartisanship in Washington, early last year came out a report that startled a lot of people. Not that don't worry, be happy crowd, but most other people. And they said that within 10 years, the deficit was going to hit 50 trillion. And it went into how that's going to be difficult because the interest expense on that alone is going to be very hard to service. In recent months, they have spoken about lowering that to as little as seven years because of how much since that report, the debt is going out of hand. So that, and that's also on the consumer side, trillion in debt, corporate debt. We just saw more borrowed now in the, in the last six to eight weeks than we've ever seen in that 
type of period. So that is still the number one. Now there's people go, oh, I've heard you guys for 20 years tell us you're right. When it was 10 trillion, yeah, it was manageable, it was 15 trillion. Understand this, the national debt was only, I hate to say it that way, it was only 22 trillion in 2019. It's gone up 50%. Going up exponentially. In five years. I mean, that's so that's the first problem. The second is a retirement crisis. And everybody goes, why, why is the retirement crisis so important? Well, when you have 65% of Americans working paycheck to paycheck, they're just never going to get to retirement. It's a fact of life. It's a sad, they're not going to reach those beautiful commercials we see on TV of how if you come with us, you'll have all this great life and enjoyment and all. On top of that, part of what number three problem is, this immigration invasion, you're now going to have 10 to 15 million people who are all coming with nothing but what their shirts on the back. So they're also going to be looking for the government to, you know, to be supportive and help and things of that nature. The fourth uh, situation is the BRICS. Now, Wall Street laughs at this right now. They just, the Main Street folks just laugh when anybody, oh, the BRICS are never going to be anything formidable. It's a bunch of loser countries and so forth and so on. You keep saying that. Well, I'll tell you the biggest single thing that happened in the BRICS. When the Saudis announced that not only are they joining, but for the first time ever said that they were willing to take other than dollars for oil, that was the beginning of the end. And where we've already seen that, we've seen smaller countries say they're not even going to take the dollar anymore. But the BRIC nations, the formation of it, people need to keep in mind that these countries are forming not to lessen their involvement with the U.S., but to not to be involved with the U.S. at all. And they're only getting stronger and stronger. And then the fifth which we kind of touched on before, and that's political paralysis. Our government is so messed up that not only do the two parties have no ability whatsoever to do anything that we need to be done together, they have people in their own party that are mad at other people in the same party. So that's political paralysis at a time when it's going to be called upon to have to deal with some of the most difficult problems this country's ever faced. So with all that, I have a very negative attitude if you look past this year and maybe next. So if you're planning out three to five years, I think your planning has to include be prepared for something that is going to be the most challenging we've ever had. And people say, well, why do you bring up the Great Depression? I said, at least in the Great Depression, there were moral and, and, and standards in this country where people would have helped each other. I don't think that's the same case now. And so, therefore, I don't have a very op, uh, pretty picture once we get past the next year or two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned all great points. Uh, I want to go back to the debt. You mentioned $34 trillion in debt. I actually pulled up the U.S. debt clock. If you think that's bad, unfunded liabilities, $212 trillion yeah. as well. Yeah, so when you, when you think about this, so let's just say the Congressional Budget Office is correct. And they're at 50 trillion. And we just put a four or five percent interest rate. That's not high. Mm -hmm. It's not high at all. It would be anywhere between two, two and a half trillion dollars in interest expense. Last year, America took in its best revenue year ever, a little over five, five trillion dollars. And of course, some of that should grow in that expand as we get to 50 trillion. But the interest expense is far outstripping it. We would be seeing over half our uh, income just to pay interest. What about something that you just brought up that no one wants to talk about? People are still expecting to get Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And there's no money sitting somewhere. As I try to explain to seniors and all when I speak to them, this isn't sitting somewhere. We've spent that money already that was taken from you and so forth and so on. So they have to come up with that. Oh, and by the way, I always had this kicker. Do you know America's largest single asset? What, are, what do we have the biggest on our books as an asset? And I tell them student loans. And now we have a president that's forgiving those billions of dollars at a time. Well, if he forgives that, that was an asset the U.S. was counting on. So that means they have to raise taxes even more. And who are they going to raise it from? You. And I point to the people and me. So it it's really a, a, a very scary, if one doesn't have peace of, in other ways, if you start to think of what it's going to be like in a few years' time. And uh, with that in mind, uh, people always sometimes ask, I don't want to take out your next question is, well, what can people do? Well, the first thing is I adopted over 20 years ago, a less is more attitude. 
I lived it that way too. I could live at a larger lifestyle, but it'd be more expensive and it would put more pressure on my day-to-day -day life. So getting out of debt or lowering debt, uh, whether you're spiritually led or not, uh, is critical. And a less is more attitude. You know, uh, years ago, a business was created through no fault of their own. It's not their fault, but they are the poster child for what's wrong with America. And that's public storage. Because here and in Canada, too, you can't drive a few miles on a main road without seeing this facility where people pay to keep stuff there. Well, our parents and grandparents, they had much smaller dwellings on average than us. They didn't need all these facilities to keep a lot of extra stuff. So the other issue always is there's too much stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does sound like it's got to get really bad. I mean, what what are some of your predictions? Like, how do we, what's going to, what's it, what's, the United States going to look, the world as a whole going to look on the other side? Well, like I told you before, my crystal ball is broken enough to that I stop looking and to try to make predictions. I am trying to be smart enough to see when I look at all these things objectively that we spoke about and said, okay, how could that turn around? How could that not be as bad as all? Can't find any of that. It just keeps, it keeps getting worse and worse. And the problem is we, uh, as Americans, I can only speak for, we have really put off a lot of things, uh, assuming that, you know, we'll worry about it tomorrow. Uh, our health, our weight, uh, all the things that uh, we, we live for today. We, even, we take away from tomorrow in order to live better today. And uh, unfortunately, when things go bad, what does all people do is they turn to the government and say, you got to do something. Well, this government is clearly indicated that it's not a people's government anymore. That I can tell you that I can speak here clearly. This is not Washington and the World Economic Forums and all. I don't think they're out there for the little person. I think they're, 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 they're associating themselves with an elite group of people who make up the top of the pyramid. And yes, they have a lot of the power and of course the money and all. And that's what they're focused on. They're not thinking what's in the best interest of, of the working class. They're thinking of what's in the best interest of the elite. And unfortunately, there's, there's not enough people that can make it to the elite and still see that these people can get by here. So I, I don't have a positive ending. Yeah. But I must tell you also, and I have to interject this, sorry for interrupting you, that mm -hmm. for me, uh, at my age, at 68, I don't think it's as severe it is going to be for my daughter, who's just 31, and for others that may even have younger children. I think they're going to have to go through a period of life far more challenging than anything someone like me had to go through. Yeah. I, I like the fact that you brought up that these, you know, the, the elites at the World Economic Forum, you know, at the very top echelons of, of government and the, around the world, you know, they have more of a loyalty amongst themselves than they do their actual people, right? Yeah, so, actually, I, I've always sensed, this is just personal view, I've always sensed that we're peons. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, they, 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 they see in... Uh, you know, they never had to experience any of the things that we had to do self-serving. There was always somebody cleaning their clothes, cooking for them, driving them, doing this, doing that and all. They almost, in a sense, haven't had to fend for themselves. And I always find it amazing that they could be over there talking about climate control when all of them came on these private jets that are sitting outside Davos and will be taken back to where they're going. How dare you try to tell me about this and I need to, I'm some poor farmer and you want me to do away with cows because somehow their, their gas is making things bad, but you, but it's okay for you to fly around, you know, on, on your jet and all. It's just, but listen, we learned, we learned a couple of things about the elitism. It, 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 it almost, took the world over an edge. We we saw their, what they believed needed to be done during the pandemic when the reality of the pandemic was being seen by people early on not to be anything close to what they were making it was. But their influence and the ability to control the people 
probably cost millions of people's lives that otherwise might have not happened. And who's to say they can't do that again? That's the scary part of all of this. Yeah, yeah, especially no one's been held accountable for anything. Um, I wanted to take things back to <clears throat> to uh, trading and investing really quick. Uh, so before we wrap things up, uh, let me get your thoughts on the uranium market. Uh, it's got a had a pretty strong run up all the way up to $106 at the moment um, from 50 some odd dollars this time last year. What do you think about uranium as it is it run hot? No pun intended. Or is there a do, do you see more upside with uranium? Well, for the uranium bulls, the best thing they have going for them is not only is their supply and demand scenario proving correct that there's just much more and more demand and the, the ability to provide the uranium to supply that is in question. But the things that were considered competitors just a few years ago, wind, surf, even the electrical cars, everybody's now seen it in the winter, their cars aren't working mm -hmm. or, you know, they're having such issues. And this is, you know, you can't get around that. What are you going to tell people? You can only use those electrical cars in the summer, you know, and not in the winter. Did you hear about what Hertz is doing with their uh, electric fleet? I, I believe they were selling it. Was yeah, it? They're, they're, they're selling a, a wholesale chunk of their electric fleet in favor of gas powered cars. Yeah. So, and that also can go back and maybe talk another day about the electrification argument it may take longer and it may not reach to the levels that we thought of a year or two ago. And we'll have to assess that as this year goes on. But the uranium story of all the metals has the best long-term sustainable fundamentals at this point in time. But the reason I came up with my situation of of using now further rises towards 150 to sell the positions we had, you have to understand where we were in from. We're in things for Cameco at eight and it's trading, you know, at 50, you know, 55. One thing I've learned, you can have all the paper profits in the world. There's no such thing as counted as a profit until you book it. And so my argument to the people that have had those things and, and all of these things are up anywhere from 100 to 400 to 500 percent is if we're fortunate and prices keep going higher, take up, take up profits. Because that other market where I've been horrendously wrong on the general junior resource market now looks like the uranium market back at 2019. So for me, I'd rather take from there and put there. Uh, that's that's the reason. If I wasn't in that, if I was just looking at uranium for the first time, the likelihood now is those majors will still continue doing well. But now some of the junior ones or advanced stage expiration are going to get interested because it has the institutional eye now that it didn't have two or three years ago. And it has the media eye. The general media is now running stories about nuclear and all. And I like to use this story. 10 or 20 years ago, you went to a U.S. senator and go, hey, I'm thinking of building a, a uranium down in Carson City, a nuclear plant, not over my dead body. Now that same senator, please, can you build that nuclear plant for me and fast? So it has the media attention, it has the political support, and it has the supply and demand scenario. So it's very hard to think that the uranium market cannot remain strong for as far out as the eye could see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how are you playing the uranium trade at the moment? You know, is it, are you more, uh, there's obviously there's the physical funds, but uh, you've got the, your major producers, your developers, your explorers. Yeah, I'm not buying any new ones because we own them so cheaper. And mm -hmm. I'm using, if there's further strength to go out, but there's such a handful of just producers I mean, if you're going to believe, and now even, even the chemical now, the question is, hey, are they at the point where they need to go out in the market and buy physical metal for delivery under prices that they made for? I mean, it's, it, it, it's such a phenomenal story on what's happening on this. When, like I said, four or five years ago, the only thing that was talking uranium were people that had been talking about it for years and had no choice, but they were stuck. But because of and trying to understand when you have 300, 400, 500 percent gains, it, it's it, it's natural to say maybe we need to take some of that off and look at something that's very cheap again. 
the uranium producers and all are not cheap anymore. Okay. They're not overly expensive, but they're not cheap. They're not looking at where people are going to ah, ask. They're not worth anything. Right now, this is how people are looking at even the Newmonts and Barracks or Juniors. Ah, I never want to touch them again. Please don't ever mention that name again, whatever it may be. That's where that's at. That's what always gets my interest. Yeah. I, I, as soon as you said junior mining uh, silver and gold stocks, internally, I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> do I have to buy more of these things? But that's usually a good indication that you, you, that it's a good contrarian play, right? You always want to go against your your knee jerk reaction. If you feel like you want to buy more, then you probably should not. If you feel like you sh don't want to buy something, um, sometimes it could be a, con a good contrarian play. What do you think? The majors are starting to take placements in them. We're starting to see some real M and A. Now, there's going to be M and A for necessity. There are too many juniors running on fumes. And a lot of these companies, I don't say a lot, that that throws too many people on the bus. There is a percentage of companies in the junior market that are really personal living expenses for the people that run them. <laughs> they just run them in cycles, raise money, do a little well, and wash it again, reverse split and start over or change the name of the company, what have you and all. But those type of companies need to be merged because there's just not enough capital to keep them going even at, you know, they got too many shares outstanding and selling for pennies at a share and all. So the first part of M&A is happening out of necessity, but we're starting to see some significant deals where majors are putting money back into junior, especially if they have, you know, good drill results and so forth and so on. And that's something that happens during a bottoming formation. But here's the issue again. Investors in general are far too short-sighted now in terms of how much time they're willing to give stuff. I'll give you just an example, if I may. In the research reports in the 80s and into the 90s, research reports always had a three to five year outlook. That's uh, literally, then you can make IBM or whatever you're talking about. Three to, and Morgan put out a report. Here's our three to five year outlook. You say to somebody now, even a great uranium stock, Oh, in the next three to five years, the three to five years, maybe three to five months. I ain't waiting three to five years. So at a time when you really need to be recognizing in, in such a market that's so beaten, a longer period to give it a chance to work, people are not. And that's where we're seeing the throwing in the towel. I, I've seen, you know, I can tell by the hate email. I have the hate email scale when the when I get five of the same type of emails in one day, I know we're getting near the bottom. Yeah, I just pulled up the average holding time of a stock uh, in, t in today. Today, it's five and a half months. In the 1960s, it was eight years. There you go. Wow. So, I mean, well, that's one way to get an edge over uh, other people. Just be patient. Be a more patient investor. Well, you know, it, it does. You know, remember this. Everything we've ever done, if you remember in life, whatever you were doing, it always seemed to took longer than we planned. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. same as in, in investing. And that's just one of the hard things that uh, the environment now. Uh, and, you know, a lot of things came along to change that. One of the reasons people held back then, well, if you bought a thousand shares of an $8 stock, you paid three, four hundred dollars in commission. Now you either pay no commission or five dollars. So if it goes up an eighth, you can actually sell it and move on and. That's another thing that, uh, especially in, in, in people that trade, but trading is, a, if I may make this comment, and I, I hope it doesn't reflect negatively to you, but half the money in the stock market now is in what they call passive funds. Mm -hmm. it's, it's held by uh, groups that are not actively managing that portfolio, meaning that they own a bunch of stocks, it's either tr tracking an index or a certain thing and they're not managers not each day looking i should buy this one sell this one and all the other half of the money about 75 percent of it is in computer driven programs of some sort of algorithm that's either trading based on simple news stories and words in the news story the very sophisticated alpha type of driven programs maybe 10 to 20 percent tops of all the money that's in the market is being invested like the old days. I'm buying a stock. I think it's going to do well. They're going to make more widgets. They're going to 
They're going to hire more people, build new factories, yada, yada, yada. That's the difference. So the older you are, I still find many people my age, the 60s and 70s, treating the market as a whole as if it was 30 or 40 years ago. And I tell them, listen, when you turn on that TV network and they show you sitting down at the New York Stock Exchange, trust me, that might as well be a museum. Most of the trading isn't even happening there. Understand that this market today that we're in is virtually 180 degrees different than the one of 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I think you got to keep that in mind too when you're generally investing. And so with that in mind, how has your strategy kind of shifted over time then if, if it's different? What well, you try to shift, but what happens is the humanness in us, our failed human nature, we don't like to change. Mm -hmm. Humans don't like change in anything, okay? And it's taken me time to do that. Uh, and, and that's probably some of the reasons why it got I got so caught up in, in first time ever badly in, in a bear market. And, and, and I wasn't prepared for, for the change that for the things that have occurred and all. And, you know, once is an experience, twice is a mistake. What you just got to prevent is that you don't go too far into something that you don't can't treat it as just a mistake, that it's life changing. And uh, so one of the things that I've, that I've been more cautious on, particularly in recent months, is that this is a lot deeper and a lot more challenging than ever before. And that's why I said to you, I fall back now on just focusing on someone who's demonstrated to me a real keenness. And then of what they may be involved with, pick and choose what fits my criteria more and the combination of their intelligence and mine hopefully be enough, you know, to turn and, and, and make the uh, success. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so we've covered uranium. We've covered gold. Let's talk about oil. Oil has been acting kind of strange lately, sitting at $74 at the moment, uh, although they did have to release about 50% of the SPR to kind of bring it down to that level. Uh, where, what do you think is going on there with, with oil? Where do you, where do you see oil? Well, I, I think we're going to have a hiccup, a major hiccup on this electrification. I wouldn't have said that six months ago, but I'll say it now. It is, I don't think it's coming as fast and as hard. And I think America made a huge mistake during all of that. See, when we had the so-called oil shock and gas prices were rising, just the Biden administration just beat the oil companies to death. They blamed them for everything. It's all your fault. You know, we're shutting down the pipe. We're not going to have pipelines. We're not going to let you explore. We're going to charge you extra money because you're just who you are. An oil company sitting in their boardroom going, why, why do we want to go out and spend a billion dollars to try to find a new field right now? That's how they feel. And then you got the way you're saying by 2035, no more gas cars. And you want me to spend all sorts of new money on CapEx to find new stuff and all. But the biggest mistake was how Biden treated the Saudis when he went over. And that was their final straw that broke the camel's back for them to say, listen, you're, you're, not our, you're not our main and key customer. You're just one of many customers. And we're going to do business with other people in other ways. It opened the door for China to come in. It changed the makeup of the Middle East. And we're seeing some of that now for the fighting that's going on and all. So while oil is depressed now because simply the world has slowed down, those who might have called it dead or or or, or finite product are in for 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 major uh, major surprise. I just don't think it. I just again for my system, it's too early yet. If all the things were said and you were telling me it was fifty seven dollars versus seventy four, I go wow, and the shares came down accordingly. But right now, it's in what I would call a no man's land. It's not yet a time to back up the truck, and it's far too late to get, get off whatever you had on the truck. And there are other things that I think are more advantageous. But at the rate things are going and the way the world is moving, it will come an important part of one's portfolio again. And therefore, it's something to eye, but not yet buy, in my view. Gotcha. Uh, and how do you typically play oil? Do you... Uh, invest like in the majors like chevron exxon uh the yeah yeah I don't know. companies okay. yeah and 
I know, I know that according to some emails, I know nothing about juniors too, but I really know nothing about oil exploration itself. So if and when I belong again, it would be through majors. Gotcha. So what is it? Is there anything right now that you've got your eye on that would be considered contrary? I know you mentioned the junior minors, but something that completely out of left field that you have your eye on. Uh, it's really not at this point. I, I would say that emerge some emerging markets particularly in Asia and even China, if suddenly they were 20% cheaper, it, it may get me to want to be long general equities again, but we're not there. I will tell you the the, the item I think that it is going to be a lot of fighting over. I don't know yet how to play it publicly. I've been researching it, but I, I think it is, and that's water. Mm. Everything that I can understand and where things are going. Water rights? water rights, the usage of water. And uh, I don't know quite yet how to, to uh, profit from it, but it's difficult. Uh, Canada's got a lot of water. If I was Canadians, I wouldn't worry about it. A lot of lakes, a lot of, uh, but there are places in the world where, even here in the U.S., we're now uh, watching uh, Farmers in the West mad how certain water is being indirected, uh, you know, to places that have been built up like around Las Vegas and so forth. I don't know yet if it's a real investment item, but it's clearly going to become a, a, an item that's going to be on many people's minds in the coming years. And uh, No, it's uh, that's very interesting. Rick Rule said the same thing when I interviewed him. He mentioned yeah. water rights as well. Yeah, I think that 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 it's going to come into play. And, uh, you know, Mer uh, Americans, like we think of, like in Israel, they turn seawater into drinking water. And I can't imagine when I walk down by my water that somehow I'm going to drink that stuff. But, you know, maybe at, at some day that's what's going to transpire. I think there's bigger problems. I think there's terrible uh, prices of food. You know, here in North America, I know it exists in Canada, but here in the U.S., more and more people, we've seen more than a doubling of people standing on food bank lines, people of working class, and the ability to get food and the cost of food. That, that's and, and I don't want to start thinking, well, how can I profit from their misery? But it is something we need to be concerned about, I think, just as human beings. Yeah. A lot of people mention that uh, the Great Depression, we had all these soup lines and food lines. And we, I mean, today, we just don't see the food lines, right? right? Because it comes in the form of food stamps, comes in, the, comes in the form of all other forms of welfare. But, you know, to, to think about it today, you know, the, is the economy really that much off of where the Great Depression was just because we don't see the actual effects of it because everything's digitized, everything, you know, is, um, is included in some form of welfare. So it, a really good point there in terms of the food line stuff. Uh, before you wrap up, I, I, you mentioned something early on in the interview that I wanted to, to poke at. Uh, you said, you said, this is something a little bit more personal. You mentioned that you used to work with athletes. I was, I was kind of wondering there, I saw a picture of you and um, one of the road uh, road warriors as well. So I was yeah, kind of wondering, like, what, what was like uh, you, some you of the early you life before? Old, you don't look old enough to know who the road warriors were. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a big wrestling fan. So, you know, my yeah. dad, me and my dad, we used to, um, you know, watch the WWF, WCW. Uh, road warrior was around at that time. He was in the golden era of the, in the 90s uh, in the WWF. So yeah. I remember the Road Warriors. Well, I'll tell you first of all, so you'll appreciate this. And I had more fun being around professional wrestlers than any other sport or, or entertainment, which, you know, really what, what they are. It, it is an unbelievable skill to watch these guys be behind a door playing cards and then go out and convince everybody and physically too, not convince everybody that they hate the guts of that guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, so there was enjoyment. So what happened was uh, in 2000, uh, I would meet uh, a former New York Giant running back who was on the first two Super Bowl teams, telling my life story at that point. Said He told me that God had sent me to meet him to start this financial service company for athletes, which we ended up doing. And uh, I did that through the year 2020. Now, during that time, I would also 
uh, go and become, do regular Bible study in chapel with the New York Giants and lesser the New York Yankees. And I knew there was a God at that time because I was a Jet and Met fan. So here I am sitting with these kids that I had hated and used to root for them to drop the ball and die. And now I'm sharing about faith with them. And so I kind of turned to like them too. And of course, I got to see two Super Bowls, which I wouldn't have if I stayed just with the Jets. But uh, what happened was, first when the kneeling started, Colin Kaepernick and things like that nature, I was outspoken about it and I lost clientele. And then when the actual, you know, social stuff hit it and starting to, to wear these things and the wokeness, uh, I said to myself, Pete, you, you you're this man of faith and you, you say these things about how people should live. And yet you're hanging around with these other people because, you know, you're making money with them and they're like woke city. Something's got to give. So I decided I would leave that business, shut it down, even though it was profitable and all, and really get turned off by a lot of the sports. Sports. One thing I'll just tell people, uh, all of it is 100 percent business now. It's that's that's exactly how everybody looks at it. And uh, but I still like hockey a lot. I still have a couple of hockey guys left and uh, hockey has not totally caved as the other major sports have, you know, and I say this to people left or right, wherever their thinking is, people go to that arena to get away for a few hours from what's ever outside. They are, they could be super liberals or super conservative, but they want to go there and whatever the team is, jump, call crazy and all. The last thing you want to do is, uh, see all that stuff from out there. And and what really made, if I may, the final decision was I had taken a client out to lunch in the heat of this while we were in the pandemic. And we were in, sitting outside because that's all you could sit at the time. And he was uh, almost 16 years of fullback in the, in the NFL. And uh, I said, to him, let me ask you something. If the waiter here and the cook and the owner came out and they started telling you about all their thoughts about what they think should be socially and wearing against what you have. What would you say? Is why well, I came here to eat. I said, that's it. Well, I came to watch sports. I didn't come to hear you guys. You guys want to do this before the game or after the game? I'll support you, but not during the game. And that's when I knew then that that time has moved beyond me. And that's why I left the, uh, I left the business world. But I'll tell you this, my three best nights ever, was with the Road Warriors at a weekend wrestling down here that we had on the Jersey Shore. And I saw these guys Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, and since you're a fan, I have to tell you this. Do you remember the, the wrestler Jim Hacksaw Duggan? Yep. So I'm meeting at this press conference. He's in civic clothes. He's talking like he normally talks. And he said, are you going to be at the reception later? Yeah, I, I look forward to talking to you. And he goes in. And then the announcer goes, and now the captain of the American team, Jim Hacksaw Duggan. And he comes out just in the moment. And, and he had a famous thing that he would do to people. And he saw me and he did it to me. I don't know if you would go back this one. He went up to me. He stuck his finger into my chest, which I thought was going to collapse. How you doing, Puff's guy? <laughs> and I realized right then that these guys are great actors. This is not him. This is an act. Just as we marvel at some actor on the screen. These guys are phenomenal because most of those guys, some of them are what they are in real life, but a lot of them. They're actors, but they do their own stunts. But they do their own stunts. And they get hurt from doing those stunts, mm -hmm. too. But uh, to me, I always had a fondness, although the wrestling now is nothing like it was 20 or 30 years ago. So, Yeah, yeah. There's uh, more of a an attention towards some of the smaller guys. Um, not much charisma well, a lot of a lot of it's away from the ring and a lot of it has interjected you know politics and social stuff and kind of stuff into that and all but it sells out and it's a business just like all the other businesses yeah yeah um well we can we can talk wrestling maybe off air or some other time but i think we're, uh, we're closing in on our hour i, I don't want to i want to be respectful of your time peter thank you so much for coming on uh it, where can people find you well, there is a website, petergranich.com, which has a blog, but I spend most of my time on Twitter or X, whatever we want to call it. And I also have a YouTube channel where I record videos and, and put up videos such as you've been kind enough to give me today an interview, a chance to speak. So that's where they can find me. 
no, it's uh, it's an honor to have you on. If you guys enjoyed this content, be sure to like the like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. Who's your favorite wrestler? Uh, what do you think about uh, 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 Peter's commentary there when it comes to uranium? Do you, do you believe that uranium is you know, potentially overheated um, or not? Do you believe that uh, the the gold mining stocks, the silver mining stocks, is this the time to you know really consider them? Let me know in the comments below. I'll try and answer every single comment as long as it's respectful. And with that said, guys, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.